It is a good morning to be together back after the new year in my second year of service with you all. I'm so grateful that you have carved out this time of your week. Time is, after all, our most valuable resource, and we have chosen to spend it in community. And I do include those who watch this later during a rebroadcast because we come to community in many ways. It's good to share this timeless time together. Now my message today is on our best of intentions. And some of you snarky folk will note that I decided against the sermon title, The Road to Hell. I love provocative sermon titles, but it didn't quite seem to be in alignment with my theology or my message. I'm not here today to talk about the road to hell. I'd rather talk about that beautiful mess that is our best of intentions. I'd like to begin with these famous words first uttered by Frederick Douglass. He said, if there is no struggle, there is no progress. Those who profess to favor freedom and yet depreciate agitation are men who want crops without plowing up the ground. They want rain without thunder and lightning. They want the ocean without the awful roar of its many waters. This struggle may be a moral one, or it may be a physical one, or it may be both moral and physical, but it must be a struggle. Power concedes nothing without a demand. It never did, and it never will. Struggle. There's nothing quite like struggle to stir up fear and anxiety in our bodies. Folks may even use metaphors that try to vividly describe that feeling. Maybe walking on eggshells or navigating landmines, trying to learn or relearn right relations. And I want to name these as problematic embodiment metaphors. They're excessive, and they, they illustrate a defensive energy rather than that of true danger, right? And Unitarian Universalists struggling with this process of returning to covenant have no right to distance themselves from contemporary abuses of language like the terms witch hunt and lynching. Our language and our acceptance of language reflects our embodied engagement with the rest of the world. Internationally recognized author on embodiment, Philip Shepard, writes about recovering our senses in the 21st century. He says, if you are divided from your body, you're also divided from the body of the world, which then appears to be other than you and separate from you. So the invitation here is to come into our bodies, to begin to feel the interconnected web of which we are all a part, and to begin to see that continuum you will see that your own change of heart pulses through your body and the body of the world. It shows up in your relationships with your neighbors, but it's a process, right? It's not a destination. And even when we get some things right, there's this overwhelming, pervading fear regarding issues of race and gender identity, sexual orientation, religious freedom, age, ability, other critical aspects of people's identities. We're terrified of being bad or wrong or doing something that's not representative of our highest and best, our best intentions, right? We're terrified of that. 
So I took a, a metaphor from, from a former New York DJ and present day cultural critic and video blogger, Jay Smooth. He did a TED talk several years ago that includes a really helpful metaphorical model, reframes how we give and receive gentle guidance back toward right relations. To paraphrase smooth, we have to stop thinking of prejudice the way we think about our tonsils. We get them removed and that's it. We don't have to worry about them ever again. If we just attend one training on undoing racism, then we're done. We're no longer capable of racism. Maybe one powerful sermon can even absolve us of our disease. But Smooth suggests that fighting racism and other forms of oppression is more like a dental hygiene model. It's how we approach brushing our teeth. So we don't have clean teeth because we went to the dentist one time or because we brushed one time. We maintain clean teeth by committing to brush every day, even multiple times a day. And when someone says, you, you've got a little something in your teeth, we don't say, no, no, I'm a good person. I brushed one time. We say, oh my goodness, thank you so much. Thank you for telling me. So these embodiment metaphors, this one made me laugh because it was so relatable. I just imagined how ridiculous it would be <laughs> to respond and say, no, no, I'm good. I'm good, I don't have anything in my teeth. How silly would that be to respond in that way? But it does, it removes us from this space of the eggshells and the landmines into places of communal space. Maybe a, a gender neutral bathroom where we can check our teeth together side by side. And we can say, hey, you've got a little racism in your teeth. Is there anything in mine? Can you see? We feel relationship in our bodies. We feel comfort, we feel discomfort, we feel safety, we feel fear, we feel assurance, and we feel threats. And our bodies communicate these things too. When I graduated from seminary, a friend gave me this beautiful basket as a gift. And she hoped that it would serve as a symbol to remind me that as a minister, I too am a vessel, a container, carefully crafted basket, tasked with the gentle art of holding. And as I've continued to look at this basket, it's woven from 12 different colors of coated wire, and I love looking at the patterns and the connections and the transitions that bring this basket together. I resonate deeply with the spiral pattern since nothing is really linear. And I recently learned a little more about basket making while listening to the audiobook of Braiding Sweetgrass by Robin Wall Kimmerer. She describes that each strand in basket making relies heavily on its neighbor, on the tension, the tugging against one another, deepening on the strength and the tension to hold them in place. And you'll notice when I set it down, it wobbles a little. The bottom is slightly rounded and it tips and rolls if there's nothing inside of it. But when you add some weight, The bottom tends to balance out. So, got some apples and oranges. There's another metaphor of how we have different ideas, but we're all a little fruity. And as we add this weight, 
it becomes firm. It's weighted and balanced because it's holding these items securely. And perhaps this was an unintended symbolism that came with her gift, reminding me of this constant process of balancing and rebalancing ourselves, the art of holding ourselves and holding others. We're like baskets, really, made up of elements to create a whole. And even still, there's a larger whole outside of our wholeness that we are a part of. The patterns that are woven by our lives are made up of a diversity of elements and varying degrees of connection. Some links are tight, where others are secure, yet include gaps. We're meant to hold things tight, yet we also have limited capacity. Sometimes finding our balance requires some heaviness. Like this multicolored basket, we're built and fortified by the diversity that is the body of the world. We are individual and we are one, part of a continuum. And as wobbly, imperfect beings, imperfect in our minds, bodies, and spirits. We must approach each other with loving kindness and attention, assuming positive intent when we're corrected, setting our privilege aside, and being willing to take the time to glance in the mirror and clear whatever might be in our teeth again and again and again. These intentions will show up in your body, so pay attention. Someone else is receiving and processing your message and your energy. So as we close today, I offer these words of blessing and encouragement to you. May we strive to pay attention to the ways our bodies engage with our best intentions. May our striving be as nourishing and formative as our shortcomings. May our bodies resonate in harmony, both as we seek and as we are found. Blessed be. May it be so. And amen.